uh, fundamentally, they are known. How can how can we possibly uh, succeed in treating so so many of these unfortunate individuals like schizophrenia and and the like? when uh, we could very well consider the aspect of what we call in Kabbalah the Dibuk. An exorcism which is so clearly spelled out in Kabbalah. Now these were the most foremost sages of our times. Now if I, if I profess to start a new religion today and this was my thinking, I'd agree, maybe I'm looking for a new religion. But I uh, have never quoted anything in that book that was not documented by some acceptable, credible, sage so many thousands of years ago. And uh, established religion, all religions, going to have to come and face up to that. What kind of reaction are you getting now from the leaders of the different Jewish religions that there are now to uh, these teachings and this insight? Curiosity, or do they look upon you as some sort of a maverick? Well, uh, fortunately, it's both. <laughs> so we're we're having uh, uh, a great number of of uh, clergy of all religions, even from Kuwait, mm -hmm. <laughs> who have uh, shown an interest, and uh, while they uh, still. Um, must conform to the principles of established religion. But uh, the interest and the acceptability and credibility of reincarnation is growing amongst the clergy, more so than you, Bill, would, would even imagine. Well, it would be kind of stunning to me to find the clergy uh, too deeply involved in it other than to try to poo-poo it and put it down for some reason or another. Well, you you can't poo, you know you can't put it down when when we're, we're referring and we're you know we're kind of uh, producing source references mm -hmm. of, of people with with credibility. There is, um, as we look at these many many cases uh, that the regressionist will do with people, where they start speaking as if they were someone else uh, living in another time and another place and perhaps even another sex speaking languages that they don't know how to speak in this lifetime you hear that that well that could be just a genetic memory that comes down rather than a spiritual memory how do you feel about that what does the Kabbalah say well that is uh, that's one of the um hints and uh, signs of a, of a prior incarnation when suddenly uh, an individual can begin speaking a language that let alone uh, uh, he never studied but uh, he didn't even visit the country of that, of that particular language and, and there he goes rattles it right off as if uh, this was his, uh, his native born land uh, there is no other explanation other than the fact that this individual lived there in a prior incarnation and has returned uh, for no other reason than uh, to correct a prior offense. Or perhaps evolve further from where he was. Doesn't necessarily always have to be a correcting process, does it? No, that's correct, Bill. Uh, you can return for the sake of, of sharing uh, some energy with close ones or the foremost one of the foremost Kabbalists uh, living in Safed the mystical city in Israel uh, Rabbi Oz Gloria who claimed that the only reason for his return was to instruct his student Rabbi Haim Vital in the knowledge of the Kabbalah and they and he himself was instrumental in producing our 17 volume uh, work on Kabbalah, the most extensive work, which was just completed uh, some two months ago. Unfortunately, it's still in Hebrew, but we're, we're moving right ahead on, on translation. We're all going to have to learn how to speak Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about you. I think you know Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> Do 
Dr. Philip S. Berg is my guest tonight. He is the author of The Kabbalah Connection, The Wheels of a Soul, Kabbalah for the Layman, uh, one of the foremost authorities on this thing that is getting attention more and more around the world, the Kabbalah. And we will continue that in just a moment. Questions for you. Uh, two concepts, rather, I'd like you to discuss. I'm very enthused that you're on the program tonight. In fact, I couldn't believe it when I heard you were going to be on. Um, first, I'd like you to talk about uh, the concept of Olam Haba and why you think so many young Jews aren't aware of this concept, this concept that we have the world to come, that uh, there is a physical resurrection in Judaism, that, um, this, that there is something more than uh, simple death and that that's it. I, I think um, among many young Jews, there is this misconception. Um, I have a degree in Judaic studies, a bachelor's, and I was always amazed in class how many people were shocked when we started discussing and uh, mentioning words like resurrection, but I guess because they grew up in a Christian society, wherein that sort of concept is linked with Jesus and, and, the, and the Christians and uh, Revelation, that sort of thing. And as you know, many Jews will shy away from things which they associate with Christianity, which, which they don't know, happen to be very Jewish in origin. I'd like you to talk about that, and I'd also like you to talk about, uh, about Hashem, about the, about the names of God, and about how in, the, in Kabbalah, some rabbis have talked about uh, certain names of God, certain ways of putting together the names, and perhaps even using gematria, and being able to create something out of that by being able to capture that essence, that power of God, which happened uh, in Bereshit. Can you uh, talk Charles, about that? Charles, can you, uh, we're going to let him wait on that because I got so wrapped up in talking to him here that I forgot something I've got to do. <laughs> so we'll be right back. I'll kind of break in on that for just a second before we can get into a, a rather, a, what's going to be a good answer to a... a, a a long string of a question, if you don't mind. And we will do that right after the news. We are just going to have to take another pause right here and take a break. Get a cup of coffee, and and uh, Rabbi Philip Berg will be back after the news and to answer Charles's questions and your questions, too, about the Kabbalah. The Kabbalah is, um, say, it's our kind of stuff. We get into astral travel here to Atlantis and certainly loving one another with an intensity that few people know how to do. It's going to be a good night, so you stay with it. I'm Bill Jenkins. Six minutes past ten on a Saturday night. Welcome to Hour Two of Open Mind. I'm Bill Jenkins. We're talking about the Kabbalah, the Kabbalah Connection. And to make that connection is Rabbi Philip S. Berg, who probably knows as much about the Kabbalah as anyone around. And we think that you'll find it quite fascinating to become familiar with it yourself. Charles was on the line when we left about ten minutes ago, Charles. Sorry about that. So uh, we'll get back to your question, Charles. Promise you that Philip will answer. Do you want to touch it again? Because just so that he gets all the points. Okay, well, I guess it was a bit thrown out the first time. Uh, what I'd like you to discuss, Rabbi, is the concept of Olam Haba and uh, in connection with that physical resurrection and uh, the, the concept of the names of God being used in connection with creation, creation of actual visual, physical objects and, and or physical realities. That's what I'd like you to talk about. Okay. That, that's my question. Right. Right, I, <clears throat> I'm right on with your question, Charles. Uh, the, uh, the concept of Olam Haba, for those who are unfamiliar with its uh, Hebrew terminology, refers to the world to come. All religions speak of the world to come. And uh, I guess some of us, many of us, or most of us, uh, may not have experienced the world to come, and so or maybe uh, it's some fantasy. But from a Kabbalistic point of view, the definition of Olam Haba is something entirely different. We're not talking about something that comes in the world hereafter. We're discussing that level of consciousness, which unfortunately for most of us, remains concealed, unseen, and untouchable. The world of metaphysics. That is the world of Olam Abba. The world of cosmic consciousness, where the past, present, and future 
all exist at the same time. You know, that only reminds me about what I read in some some physics books about the footprint on on the Santa Monica Beach. That will be made, and we're observing it right now, but that's going to be made sometime tomorrow by some individual. And we see it right now before he's even gotten to the beach. That uh, implies, from a Kabbalistic point of view, that there are two aspects. The world of the conscious, what I'd like to refer to as the world of the unreal world, because that involves the five senses, the limitation of five senses, which goes and brings us to a, a point uh, of what I call the unreal reality. When we speak of the manifestation of Olam Haba, it is that area where suddenly we receive and achieve a pure awareness of things that heretofore had been somehow uh, hidden, concealed. You know, it even reminds me of, uh, uh, of the most elementary uh, example that I'd like to give when someone's about to uh, tie a package and he's gotten together the, his string and paper and uh, everything else. and. When he's just about ready to tie the package, he can't find the string, and then he looks all over the, his place, his apartment, and he just can't find it. When he returns back to the place where the package is, lo and behold, the, the string was there all the time, but he didn't see it. And uh, many of us kind of think we think we don't, but we do see things, and we're, we're a little confused. Uh, another example I'd like to give is when uh, sometimes we call our friends and say, oh, you know, I met you at... Um, at uh, some boulevard, uh, the intersection of two boulevards, and uh, uh, but I didn't have a chance to get over and talk to you. And the other, your friend tells you, "Well, I, that was impossible. I, I wasn't in LA today. I was in Paris." And then we uh, kind of shy it off and say, "Oh well, uh, it probably must have been someone who looked like you." And the answer is no. That was you there because at that moment, your energy intelligence, the real you, which is not limited. The cosmic conscious level of you, that 90% possibly of you, that can travel faster than the speed of light, can bring you from Paris to Los Angeles in that split moment. And you were there, and I saw you. I saw you physically. We sometimes, <clears throat> excuse me, refer to that phenomenon as teleportation. But teleportation is right there in the Bible, and I, I think we, I mentioned that in uh, Wheels of a Soul. So Olam Abba is very real, right here, not in the hereafter. Now, uh, well, Rob, Rabbi Berg, are you saying then that both in the Kabbalistic point of view and in that point of view in reference to other commentary, and specifically Barakot 17a and Seder Eliyahu Rabbah, that there is no world to come, there is no, uh, there is no something beyond uh, the point of death wherein man and those who have followed the Noachian precepts have something to look forward to in some other physical earthly realm. Are you saying that indeed that once man, men die, whether they achieve that consciousness or not, it, there is nothing else? Or are you saying absolutely yes or absolutely no? No, I, I, didn't, I didn't imply that at all. What I meant to say, the term hereafter, uh, that is used uh, in the mainstream of religion generally refers to only a hereafter. Now there is there is a place there is a place mm -hmm. within our universe that after death the soul awaits its either return to be uh, incarnated for a second time or a third time or for the one thousandth time mm -hmm. Or it just remains until the time of resurrection, the time uh, then when all souls will uh, will meet its former corporeal body. But this time, rather than the corporeal body having dominion over the soul with its desire to receive for oneself alone, that greed and corruption, which is the energy intelligence of the body, uh, the soul will 
will rule. So there, there is both Olam Haba and uh, the world where souls reside until such time as they either return for incarnation purposes or the, at the time of resurrection. So Rabbi, then you, you have answered my question. The answer is yes. Uh, that you do agree then uh, that there is the resurre a, a resurrection for us as Jews. I'm talking about totally separate from the Christian point of view or any other. Uh, but from our point of view, there is a resurrection, and indeed there is some whatever that may be. There is some world. Um, well, anyway, let's get to my second question very quickly. I know other callers are, are waiting. Um, in regard to the uses of the names of God in Kabbalah and those references to, and in Zohar, rather, to, to uh, actual creation, I think in one as an instance, and I don't have the, the reference, uh, one rabbi created a cup or something on the table as they were discussing this, as they were involved uh, in using the names of God. And in the same way that, that, that the priests of the olden days, that the Kohens brought, uh, used these mighty names of God in the temple, and that people were just... Which just uh, which is overshadowed by this incredible name. What do you think of that? Do you think there is creation by that uh, by that process, or is that, in your opinion, just mythic? Oh, I I guess uh, when I first became involved in Kabbalah, one of the first questions that uh, I began to ask was uh, was the Lord a member of the underground or the underworld? I mean, he assumed so many aliases. There were so many names for God. Now, what was the reason for? so many names you know there is uh, Elohim there is uh, the Tetragrammaton there is I mean I can just go on and on and on now why, what is the reason for so many names of God and so uh, from a, a Kabbalistic point of view uh, and this concept of God is he a man or what is it and so uh, from a Kabbalistic point of view uh, the Lord for us means uh, the force an energy force. An energy force of which its energy intelligence represents one concept and one concept alone. And that is the desire to share. There are different levels of that force. That force that uh, in my new book to be seen shortly, uh, how a creation came about by the letters themselves, the Hebrew letters, in which different levels of consciousness uh, exist in our, in, our, in our universe. In other words, we go up a ladder as each one achieves an altered state of consciousness. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't achieve the ultimate as Moses who could just by uttering a name, as the Bible says, uh, uh, was the way he smote the, uh, the Egyptian. It was not uh, through a physical force. It was through a combination of letters. In this case, the tetragrammaton. That tetragrammaton is a very potent force. Yes. Uh, that force, that force, will be our only protection if that final war of Armageddon ever comes about. That's going to be the only protection for all mankind. That means for Jew and non-Jew alone, uh, alike. So. That's what the names are all about. I think I hope I've answered your question. Rabbi, it's an excellent answer, and thank you for being guest. Bye bye. He touches bye -bye. it on page 161 of his book, The uh, Kabbalah Connection, if you want to take a look at it. Charles, thank you very much for your question. I'm Bill Jenkins. With me is Rabbi Philip Berg. Rabbi Philip Berg. About the Kabbalah? That's what we're talking about. And we are talking to uh, Alan. Alan, welcome aboard. Hi, people. How are you doing? Doing fine. Bye, yeah. Alan. Uh, Dr. Berg made a statement that. Um, he felt that uh, moral codes and traditional doctrines were uh, problematic to uh, knowing oneself and higher awareness, and he he sort of dropped the bottom line that sharing was the antidote. And I was wondering what the Kabbalah and his uh, perspective or view is on human sexuality. Is it merely a, a thing of sharing, or is there some moral consideration, say, in regard to premarital sex, for example? Um, you can put on your Dr. Tony Grant hat. <laughs> <laughs> I've always, uh, I've always raised the question. You know, people get married and they have children, and uh, we know that uh, certainly in in 20th century, they, uh, it's quite a problem bringing up children. Yet we still go ahead 
<clears throat> excuse me, and people have children now, knowing that there's going to be a lot of problems that follow in having children. And uh, just why do people have children? Uh, from a rationale, uh, from a, a rationalistic point of view, or doesn't seem logical at all. And so... I've often thought that. <laughs> and four of them. <laughs> Wasn't anything rational about that at all. Right. And yet, and yet th that, that's the way civilization continues. So there must be another driving force, questions the Kabbalah, that somehow, from a, uh, a cosmic energy intelligence, something enters into most people who do have children and some, somehow direct them into having children. For what purpose? Why is, does this cosmic energy intelligence exist in the first place? 